Buddha once said there are two factors that are primary in gaining awakening and putting an end to suffering. The primary external, fa external factor is having admirable friends, people who are good examples. Because you learn not only what they have to say, but also you look at their actions. You can pick up a lot that way, too. And their example that it is possible to lead a life that's harmless, lead a life that leads to the end of suffering. That you can be happy being harmless. That's an important message right there. You look around us for most people in the world. The examples are, if you're going to gain happiness, you've got to gouge this person and take advantage of that one. That's all pretty depressing. If you can find actual people to be around, that's really helpful. Otherwise you have to read about the inspiring ajans and the, the monks and nuns from the Buddhist time. And remember, those are human beings. It's not just made-up texts from the past. These real-life human beings with real-life problems. They had suffering just like you. They had all the various weaknesses that you have. But they also had strengths, just like you have. And they were able to take advantage of those strengths to overcome their own weaknesses. That's an inspiring example. The primary internal factor that leads to awakening is appropriate attention. That means looking at life in terms of the big problem. The fact that there is suffering and stress, and the fact that it's caused by things that happen in the mind. So you want to learn how to change those causes so the mind actually gets on the path to the end of suffering. And you learn to look at issues in that way. Where is the stress here? What's causing it? And particularly, what's the mind doing that's causing it? And you have to balance both the internal factors and the external factors, because even admirable friends have their, have their failings. You're not going to meet anybody out there who's perfect. Even the great Johns have personality quirks. Then you'll have to learn how to separate out. Okay, what's the personality quirk and what's the the principle that they embody that really is worth emulating? Then you use appropriate attention to do that. At the same time, if you have a good good teacher, a good friend. That person can help point out to you where you're not really paying appropriate attention or where your understanding of appropriate attention is still lacking. So these are the issues you have to look at as you practice, especially when you're practicing away from a community like this, when you're on your own. Who are the people you're hanging out with? It's not just the flesh and blood people, they're the, the people who write the articles in the magazines and the newspapers and who write the blogs on the internet, who write what, what's being said on TV and the radio. These are the people you hang around with as well. You have to be very selective who you hang around with, because often without thinking you pick up their values as to what's important in life. In most of these media, the message is things that somebody else is doing someplace else. That's important. Whereas the message of the, the Dharma is what you're doing right here, right now. That's what's important. So you've got to learn how to filter out any influences that would pull you away from this point. Try strengthening your appropriate attention. Try to 
be very articulate in the questions you bring to your practice, to your daily life. What do you want out of the day? Over the weekend we were talking about the fact that many of us would like to see closure in our lives. We set certain things into motion, families, projects, relationships. And we'd like to see how do they end. Well, the point of the whole teaching on samsara is that things don't really end. They just keep wandering on and on and on. The only real end point, the only real closure is awakening. And you can't be in control of whether you're going to live long enough to see even a measure of closure. All these ongoing stories in your life. What you can be in control of is what you put into the system, what choices you're making, what goals you set for yourself in terms of the quality of intention that you're going to apply to any situation. This is where right resolve is important. The primary resolve is harmlessness. You don't want to cause harm to yourself or anyone else. And the other two forms of right resolve fall under this. On the one hand, there's the resolve for renunciation. You want to wean yourself away from your sensual addictions, because these cause conflict. There's only so much pleasure to go around in terms of sensuality. As the Buddha said, if it, even if it rained gold coins, we wouldn't have enough for our sensual desires. And all too often when you want something, somebody else wants it as well. I think that story in the newspaper recently where the one person wanted to build a new house it was blocking out the other person's view. Of course, the first person thought, well, this is my property, I can do what I want. The other person said, well, that was my view first. Of course, they're both wrong. The property doesn't really belong to the first person, the view doesn't belong to the second. But when sensuality is uppermost in your mind, uppermost in your life, you start laying claim to all kinds of things that are going to lead to trouble, to conflict. So this is why we practice concentration. This is why it's such an important part of the path and why it's so ironic that of the eight factors of the path, this is the one that many schools of thought want to drop away. They'd like to have a sevenfold path because concentration is hard. It takes effort. And people who find thinking about the drama easy often find it hard to meditate get the mind to settle down. But it's the concentration that makes all the difference in the world. When the Buddha discovered the path, the right concentration was the first factor of the path that he discovered. He talked about all the other factors in the path as requisites or supports for a right concentration. Because it's only when the mind is really settled in with a sense of well-being here inside the body. that it can wean itself away from the dangers of sensuality. That's one part where the Buddha says, if you don't have the kind of pleasure that can come from right concentration, then no matter how much you may know about the drawbacks of sensuality, you still can't help going back, because the mind needs pleasure. So we develop concentration as the goal of our renunciation. It's not that we're trying to deny ourselves of things. We're trying to find a happiness that's better, a happiness that's more solid. This, of course, goes against a lot of what the world has to say. So again, this is why you have to be careful about who you listen to. It's not just the media out there. A lot of therapists will scoff at the idea of renunciation. It's unhealthy, they say, unnatural. This attitude, what you might call the attitude of addiction, permeates our culture. And 
means when you see the danger. That's one of the goals you can make uppermost in your daily life. You want to learn how to find a sense of well-being that doesn't depend on nice sounds, nice sights, nice smells, nice flavors, nice tactile sensations. A sense of well-being that comes simply by breathing and staying settled inside. The other form of right resolve that's important, of course, is non ill will, which covers trying to develop goodwill, trying to develop compassion, trying to develop equanimity. When you see the people who are acting in unskillful ways, people who have harmed you or harmed people that you love or people that you're concerned about, you can't let yourself give in to ill will, no matter how bad that person may be. If you're acting on ill will, it's very likely that you will do something unskillful. And so you have to ask yourself, if that person is behaving in an unskillful way, how you can stop that person without at the same time giving in to ill will. This is where goodwill is important. You understand it's not only for your purpose or for your sake or for the sake of the people you love, but also for that person who's misbehaving. That would be good for that person to stop. When you think in those terms, then you can start thinking about, well, what can we do, what can we to say to this person that will make that person more likely to stop, want to stop, see that it's in his or her best interest to stop. So goodwill is not being a, I mean, being a doormat or being totally passive. It simply means that you've got to be more strategic and really think of the well-being of everybody involved when you try to bring about a solution to a problem. Now these are attitudes that you can bring into any situation, and they're attitudes you can be proud to bring in any situation, proud of the fact that you've brought them into any situation, regardless of whether you get to see closure in that situation or not. So the practice is both a matter of learning the techniques that allow you to develop these forms of right resolve and not feel taxed and overburdened or strung out by trying to do the skillful thing. One of the whole purposes of right concentration is to give you strength. The Buddha's image is of the food in a fortress. The soldiers in the fortress have to fight off the enemy. Mindfulness, the guardian at the door, has to keep the, the sneaky spies away. In other words, your unskillful thoughts, unskillful influences from inside and out. And the soldiers of your right effort have to fight off the enemy that's trying to climb up the walls. So both the guardsman and the soldier, soldiers need food. That's what's provided by right concentration. That's why this is such an important part of the path. At the same time, you have to remember what you're fighting for. You've got certain values that are going to be contrary to the values of society at large. This is true in every society in which Buddhism is a spread. It's just that our society is so much in your face. You go home and there are these boxes which the outside world is just available. And it's so easy to get onto the boxes or the tablets or whatever shape they're in now. So you have to be very careful about where you go and what you explore, not only in your physical space but also in cyberspace, in TV space, in radio space. Learn to take the attitude of an anthropologist. This culture is very strange. Listen to the Dharma as much as you can. Try to associate with people of right view as much as you can. So you can keep your values alive. 
And that's why the technique of right concentration helps support your right views and right attitudes, and your right views and attitudes help give you support for your concentration. Because as the Buddha points out, as right resolve develops, it becomes one with the concentration. The factors of the path all come together. So the practice is not just doing a technique, but it's also realizing why it's important, why you need it, and how you can apply it. And how you can create an environment in which it can grow. You really do want to take charge of your life. After all, it's, it's either going to cause you suffering or it's going to bring you happiness. That's the big issue in life. And you want to make sure that it has priority in all your considerations. Don't let other people's priorities come in and push this one out of the way. <laughs>